All right, time now for another edition of Ask the Expert here on CTV Morning Live. We have Brenda Hollingsworth with us today, so don't forget if you have questions, get them to us and we'll put them to Brenda. 613-789-6559, extension 2803. You can tweet us your questions. You can put them up on our Facebook page. You can also send us an email, which is also a very easy way to do it, uh, and get those questions to us. All right, Brenda, good morning. Morning. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. On this chilly morning. Ugh. Right? Unacceptable. <laughs> we'll take it up with Rosie later. Okay, let's talk about a couple scenarios, um, some that might be common at this time of year. Yep. Scenario number one, you are crossing the street as a pedestrian. You are walking between the two white pedestrian crossing lines on a green light. You don't notice a crack in the pavement. As you walk, your sandal gets stuck in the crack. You fall forward and break your wrist and seriously bang up your knee. Is someone at fault? If so, who? Right, so this is a scenario that we've had many times and this time of year, cracks and potholes are bad. So if someone's at fault, it's probably the municipality. Uh, might also be you, depending on the shoes that you're wearing, right? Sandals, are they, you know, flat sandals? Are they stilettos? That might make a difference. But if there's a possibility that it's the municipality's fault, you need to remember there's a 10 day notice period, right? So you have to let the city know that, and that's not just Ottawa, that's any city in Ontario. You have to let them know that something has happened within 10 days. If you don't, it's not necessarily fatal in the sense that if you have a reasonable excuse and the city's not prejudiced, uh, you might be able to get away with it, but try to give the notice right away. The city being because it's a it's a road. That's and right. Roads are managed and maintained and owned by the municipality. That's right. And there's a standard actually. There's a published standard that says, you know, it's not every crack that's going to result in responsibility. It has to be a certain width and it has to be a certain depth. And so you're going to want to get that evidence. If you contact a lawyer early, the lawyer will go and measure, um, you know, you need to be careful in the middle of the street doing that. Right. Um, but you can also do it with a tape measure and make sure you measure the depth because the depth is important. Don't do it if it's not safe. Um, and, you know, you can do it with a loony or a toony or tape measure, uh, $20 bill, uh, whatever it takes, but, but be safe. Make sure you get pictures mm -hmm. um, or get that lawyer involved right away so that they can look after that for you. 10 days is not a long time. Why is it such a short period? It's part of the legislation. Uh, the provincial government uh, gave that to the municipalities to protect them from liability. And also, I mean, in, if you think about snow and ice, if somebody's complaining about an ice condition, city doesn't have time to inspect it or doesn't have notice of it to inspect it, and then the situation changes, mm. they've lost their chance to defend and say, no, there was no ice. Right. Um, you know, with, with potholes and cracks, we do see, um, you know, if you, if they, if the city finds out, you call 311 or what have you, um, and then we go to take pictures and it's filled, mm. right? Now there, there are, there are solutions to that. You can get an engineer, you can get permission to have an engineer drill into the, uh, fix and they can determine how deep it was, but that's expensive yeah. and not perfect and you might not get permission or it might be a big fight. So the best thing to do is to preserve that evidence ASAP. Send somebody, you might be incapacitated, you might have a broken leg or something. Send somebody, preferably a lawyer or an investigator, right. um, but send somebody to capture that evidence. I would think a lawyer is the best thing to do because a uh, best person to get to do that work because you, the lawyers will know exactly what to do. Yeah, what that, to look for, what to measure, the, you know, just knowing the laws. Right, there are lots of cases where people have presented photos and the judge says, what am I supposed to see in this photo? Uh, oh you my know, goodness. like it's obvious to you, yeah. but it's not obvious to a judge or a jury who can't tell the depth from the photo. I mean, there are ways engineers can take photos and sort of figure out uh, yeah. the depth uh, as long as you have the right angles, as long as you have the right lighting. Yeah. Um, so the best thing to do is to actually go and measure. And we're back with Brenda Hollingsworth today on 
personal injury lawyer with OJ Hollingsworth, and you can ask her any questions. If you have some personal injury questions you'd like to have answered, you can do it right now by giving us a call or sending us an email. Ottawa.morning at ctv.ca. We're running through a few scenarios that are really common in your practice at this time of year at your firm. Let's talk about this next scenario. Okay, so here it is. Your car starts to break down on the highway. You put your flashers on and try to get to the right shoulder. You have to cross a lane of traffic. As you get into the right lane, the car behind you hits you. You suffer a whiplash injury. Is someone at fault? If so, who? Right. This is going to be one of my favorite answers. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect lawyer answer. So um, the normal rule in Ontario is if you hit someone from behind, you are probably going to be at fault. Right. There are ways to refute that, but most of the time you're going to be at fault. It becomes a little blurrier when somebody has uh, cut in front of you. And so there, uh, it's going to be really a he said, she said, she said, he said scenario uh, where uh, the actual description of speeds and you know how much in advance the person cut in, uh, all of those things are going to be relevant. Mm. But uh, as a driver, the thing you need to remember is uh, if you if you hit someone from behind, you're probably going to be uh, liable. And so, you know, you got to keep your eyes open. People have to get across lanes often. Um, and if they've got their flashers on properly and they've got a, an emergency, there is a good chance that you're gonna gonna carry at least the lion's share of the responsibility. Mm. Now, if that person knew that their car was in trouble, or if um, you know, they hadn't had it serviced, all of this would come out in a lawsuit, uh, if there were one, if, if they should have known that the car wasn't appropriate for the highway, mm -hmm. that could change things. Uh, if they erratically went across multiple lanes, it could change things. Mm. Um, but really, uh, the obligation is on that vehicle coming up from behind. Wow. Yeah. Even if it is like a cutting off kind of scenario. Yeah. I mean, cu cutting off, you know, is a subjective, uh, yeah. is a subjective thing. And it will, uh, again, it'll depend on the evidence that this is one of those situations where a dash cam would pot potentially make a difference. Yes. Uh, where the air uh, airbag module, what we think of as the black box, uh, if it was a serious enough accident and we got the black boxes, that would tell the speeds and, you know, if somebody slammed their brakes on suddenly, all of that we would know and an engineer would be able to determine who was at fault. In a really serious accident, that's what we would do. We would get, we would get engineers, the defendants would get engineers and they would figure out exactly what happened. Mm. We may still not know who's at fault, but at least we'd know what the actual facts were that right. led to the collision. It's interesting. And then, you know, what about if you're in that scenario, what do you do immediately after to protect yourself? Should you need to, you know, have a case? Eventually? Right. Well, hopefully, if you, with any luck, um, somebody else stops, an independent witness stops, right? That's your best case scenario always is an independent witness and you get their name, you put it in your phone right away. Uh, that will be ideal. Um, you know, the, where the damage is on your car, I don't suggest taking the photos on the highway, um, but make sure that you document the damage on your car, make sure the, doc, um, the damage on the other car gets documented. One thing to keep in mind is if you're hit by like an old crappy car where they may not have collision insurance, we've seen this a few times where a car just gets sent off to scrap after a collision and there's no photos of the damage because there was no insurance claim, uh. that can become very difficult. And so now I sort of am alive to the fact that if you get hit by a jalopy, take some pictures of the of the damage because that car's going to disappear. Wow, interesting. Yeah. You brought up a good point too about, um, you know, having an eyewitness who's a third party is one of the best things you can do. What if you are ever find yourself in a scenario like that? If you see an accident, should it, you know, I think a lot of people think, oh, it didn't involve me, like I'm just yeah. gonna keep going. Can you really be a big help? You can be a huge help. And it, I mean, it is such a giving thing to put your name forward as somebody who's willing to be a witness. The chance of your case, of the case going to trial is extremely small. Okay. Like, like 
less than 3% go to trial. And if you give a witness statement, that will help it not go to trial. Mm. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great if you can speak up, uh, give your information. Do you give your name and number to both parties? Uh, you know, it's your choice, yeah. uh, or to the police, yeah, right? Okay. That, you know, you don't want to give your personal information to the parties, but the police are there. Right. Give it to the police, give okay. a statement to the police. It really, really helps, yeah. right? Because, you know, if, if my client's at fault, I don't want to find that out at a trial, right? Right. I want to find that out as early as possible. And if you tell me that, I'm probably going to believe you. We're back. Ask the expert today. We have Brenda Hollingsworth with us. And there's all the information on your screen if you'd like to reach out to her directly. Or you can always send in your questions here. And we have one coming in this morning we'd like to get to. It's from Tammy. Tammy asks, I was in an accident a few days ago. I initially refused an ambulance but started feeling pain later that day. They now want me to do a physio and a CT scan on my head. The other driver was at fault. Do I have a case? You might, um, you know, uh, refusing an ambulance is very common in the moment you don't realize how serious your injuries are and that's, so that's not going to keep you. You obviously went to the doctor or the hospital shortly after the accident, which is really important, but you did that, so that's good. Uh, the other driver's at fault, um, then, you know, you're not going to have a liability problem. So it's really going to be whether or not your injuries turn out to be serious enough to meet what's called the threshold in Ontario. So in Ontario, you have to have a serious and permanent injury in order to be able to sue for damages. Uh, and it has to have a severity of, you know, sort of more than $45,000. Okay. So that's kind of the threshold. That's very rough. You should actually speak to a lawyer about the threshold. Mm -hmm. But as long as your injuries are serious enough to pass that threshold, you should have a case. Now, the physio is going to be paid for by no-fault benefits because, remember, we all have no-fault benefits on our own insurance, uh, also called accident benefits, also called SABs, also called ABs. That's all the same thing, and that covers medical rehab. It covers uh, income replacement if you can't work, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and some other sort of very particular benefits. So you get those from your own insurance company. Make sure you go for that CT scan. That's really important. So your own insurance company pays for all that physio that she could need, all of the rehabilitation she may need. If she had a case, it would be a suit that does not cover that. It's simply to gain, uh, I guess, a compensation in form of... Pain and suffering, for sure. Okay. Now, the income replacement from the accident benefits, it's only 400 a week maximum. So if you're a higher income earner, you're, you're going to get the difference from the lawsuit. Yeah. Uh, the medical rehab in the accident benefits is up, depends on the severity of your injuries, but some people only get $3,500. Mm. Some people get more, it depends up to a million dollars, depending on your policy and the severity of your, uh, of your injuries. So some of that can also come from the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. um, what can't come from the accident benefits is pain and suffering. And sometimes people get confused about that. Why, you know, what about my pain and suffering? Well, that's the other driver's insurance. And that is typically through a lawsuit. Sometimes it's just negotiated. Yeah, and how do you how do you define the pain and suffering? It, it can, pay, I mean, pain is a very broad term. Could it be psychological pain, yes. emotional pain? Obviously, you probably suffered physical pain. How is that defined? Yeah, so the full word for or the full phrase for pain and suffering is uh, pain and suffering and loss of enjoyment of life. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a sense of what it covers. Uh, in Ontario, most of our pain and suffering really comes down to loss of function. Mm -hmm. So they look at what, what could you do before the accident and what did you do and how has your life changed. And so when, you know, one negative thing about it is if you're the kind of person who pushes through pain, you end up getting less, mm -hmm. which you know, isn't really fair on one hand. But on the other hand, I guarantee you, if you're living your life to the best that you can, you're having a better life than the person who gets the higher money. Mm. So you should still, you know, live your life as well as you can. But, um, you know, it's really uh, a court will look at other cases that have come before and, you know, look at the type of injuries and compare it to your injuries. And, okay, this person got $65,000. She was a little bit older. Uh, you know, okay, well, maybe you should get 72. Like that, that's sort of how it works. It's okay. not a science. 
Okay. It's definitely an art. It definitely makes a difference if you have someone advocating for you. Um, advocacy is really important when it comes to determining um, pain and suffering. And that's where a lawyer comes in. It really helps. Yeah, yeah, because you have all the knowledge of the law and the definitions of all of these terms and how broad they are or not broad and, and then essentially knows how to ad advocate on your behalf. You also mentioned um, like a, a, an injury that is like sustained. So something that you would deal with forever or because I'm thinking in cases like whiplash, something like a concussion or like, how do you define that in terms of the injuries? Well, it really doesn't go by the diagnosis. Ah. So that's the thing. So um, because most concussions get better in a, you know, sort of a right. short period of time within a year and many within three months. Uh, other concussions, you get something called post-concussion syndrome and it really follows you for years. Mm. And so that's why, you know, somebody comes into our office with a concussion and says, what's my case worth? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> um, because it's really going to, we really have to see what happens to you. Because, right. you know, the people who don't get better from concussion are called the miserable minority. Um, and yeah. for a good reason. But we don't know if you're there or not. So, I mean, you touched on this. I like how you say the answer is always depends yeah. because every case is very unique. So, I mean, more reason, all the more reason to contact a lawyer and get your answers that are specific to your exactly, case. Exactly, right? Going it's, by what your neighbor got for yeah. their somewhat similar injury is really not useful. All right, Brenda, as always, great information. Yeah, thank you. We'll take a quick break. If you'd like to contact Brenda directly if you have more questions, and thank you to Tammy for your question. Hope you get uh, better soon there. There's all the information on your screen.